preface of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by betty b preface the purpose of this book is to give a simple knowledge of the peoples and countries of africa as they are to-day it is not intended as a geography but merely to supplement and enliven the study of the geography textbook by being read in connection with it the author takes the children on a personally conducted tour around and through the great african continent the journey being one of exploration and study as well as of sightseeing the travellers cross the atlantic ocean from new york to the strait of gibraltar and spend some time in the lands along the mediterranean visiting morocco algeria tunis and tripoli they go by caravan into the desert of sahara stopping in the oases and learning about the life and trade of that region and then make their way on to egypt and far up the nile into nubia from nubia they cross the country to the highlands of abyssinia and go on down to the indian ocean where they take ship for mombasa in british east africa by means of the railroad which the english have built they travel between mount kenya and kilimanjaro to lake victoria and explore the great rift valley learning about its people animals and plants their next trip is across the sudan to lake chad and thence over hausa land and by the upper niger to timbuktu and on through the french territories of senegal to the atlantic ocean from there they visit the spanish possessions farther north senegambia sierra leone liberia and the countries along the gulf of guinea which form the true home of the negro are next seen and then a long journey is made up the congo and across country to lake tanganyika and german east africa from dar es salaam the capital of german east africa a short visit is paid to the island of zanzibar which is under the protection of great britain after which the portuguese possessions on the east coast are visited and their people described the basin of the zambezi is next taken up and then comes the new world of british south africa with its stock farms gold fields diamond mines and other industries showing how a white civilized people has grown up in the southern end of the black continent after visiting natal the garden of south africa the steamer takes the children to cape town and from there on up the western coast of the continent calling at the ports of german southwest africa and angola the west african portuguese possession completing the tour much of the book is the result of the personal observations of the author who has travelled through some of the countries described other parts are based upon the best authorities of recent african exploration and effort has been made to verify such information as far as possible end of preface chapter one of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by betty b chapter one from new york to gibraltar for the next few months we are to travel together in africa we have already started and are now sitting on the deck of a great ocean steamer as it moves toward the east we left our home some days ago and sailed out through the harbor of new york past staten island and on into the atlantic we said good-bye to our friends at the wharves wiping the tears from our eyes as we did so and waving our handkerchiefs as long as we could see the first day or so was spent in getting over our seasickness and we are now thoroughly enjoying life on the ocean we have become used to the steamer and have explored every part of it from the bridge where the captain stands down to the furnaces near the keel where day and night sooty-faced brawny-armed men are shoveling in coal we chat with the officers and sailors run races over the deck and play all sorts of games such as quoits and shovelboard part of the time we hang over the rail watching the blue waters of the atlantic ocean churn to white foam as we plow our way through them or stand at the prow looking toward africa which is to be our home for months to come 
we spend hours upon deck in steamer chairs studying books and maps from the ship's library to get some idea of the country and to plan out our tour it is a great undertaking that we have before us africa is with the exception of asia the largest of the earth's grand divisions it is three times the size of europe more than half again as large as south america nearly one-fourth larger than north america and about three times as large as the united states including alaska and our outlying islands africa contains more than one-fifth of all the land upon earth let us take a look at the african continent as it lies on the map notice its simple formation it has but few bays no long peninsulas and no arms of the sea running far into the land if we could view it as the sun sees it we should observe that it consists of a vast plateau of irregular shape with ranges of mountains about the edges this makes the interior difficult of access from the sea especially as there is a strip of lowland between the coast and the plateau which is so malarial that those who cross it are sure to have fever africa has mighty rivers but most of them have rocky cataracts where they break through the mountains and are hence unnavigable by vessels from the sea it is partly on this account that the continent has remained so long unexplored by white men although it lies so near europe looking again at africa through the eye of the sun we observe that it is the hottest of the chief land divisions the equator runs through its centre and heat waves are always dancing upon most parts of it moreover in the north is the desert of sahara as large as the united states and in the far south is another desert kalahari not nearly so large but almost as dry two-fifths of africa is arid or covered with scrubby bushes the remainder is high grassy plains and dense dark forests through which we might travel for miles and miles without a glimpse of the sun there are also a few large tracts of cultivated land our journey will by no means be an easy one africa has but few railroads and our travels will be chiefly in boats on foot on horseback on camelback and in chairs and litters carried on the shoulders of men we have our guns with us most of africa is inhabited by savages some of whom are cannibals and its wilds are the homes of lions panthers leopards and the terrible gorilla a fierce ape as tall as a man and much stronger it has elephants giraffes antelopes buffaloes and ostriches its rivers are full of crocodiles and the rhinoceros and hippopotamus are found in the woods and swamps africa is known as the dark continent it is the land of the dark-skinned races and especially of the woolly-haired negro in the northern parts north of the sahara the natives are more like europeans or asiatics many of them are arabs the descendants of men who conquered these regions ages ago they have brown or sallow faces straight noses and features like ours south of the sahara where most of the population is the natives are nearly all negroes they are of many languages and many tribes some are tall well formed and fine-looking and others pygmies or dwarfs some are savage and some almost civilized in the extreme south there are many europeans chiefly english and boers altogether africa is supposed to have two hundred million inhabitants but they are very unevenly distributed some tracts having no people whatever for ages this continent has been in a savage state its tribes have been warring upon enslaving and in some cases eating one another and in most parts of the continent there has been continual war within the past few years however the great powers of europe have taken possession of africa and almost the whole continent is now ruled by them each power has an army in its territory to keep peace and is also developing the country and its trade in many places roads and railroads are building so that in time it will be possible to travel through africa almost as well as at home at present the british have more african territory than any other european people they control tracts larger than all europe their colonies being scattered over the whole continent and especially throughout the southern western and central portions egypt with the country just south of it is a dependency of great britain the french rank next to the british among the foreign landowners 
their territories being as large as the main body of the united states they govern algeria tunis most of the western part of the sahara and much of the sudan south of it the belgian possessions lie along the congo in central africa and the germans and portuguese have colonies on the eastern and western sides of the continent the turks rule parts of the sahara and tripoli and the spanish have minor dependencies we shall learn however as we travel over the country just what each nation has and shall see that in most places the natives are better off than when they governed themselves the tourist life upon shipboard is a lazy one and our eyes leave our books again and again to look at the waves as they roll on and on until lost in the sky in the distance it grows warmer as we steam eastward now schools of flying fish flash like silver arrows as they dart from wave to wave now porpoises race along side by side with the steamer rising and falling as though playing leapfrog and now a huge whale spouts up a geyser of water away off at the right or left as we approach the coast of southern europe seagulls by the score come out and follow the ship swooping down at times for the scraps of food thrown overboard we pass through the azores a group of fertile volcanic islands and a little later sight the red cliffs of cape st vincent on the portugal coast we have our first glimpse of the african mountains as we enter the strait of gibraltar and as we come to anchor in gibraltar bay under the frowning guns of the british fortifications africa is in plain view over the way end of chapter one chapter two of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b morocco before we cross the strait of gibraltar let us take a look at the northwestern part of the african continent this region is so different from the others that it has its own name it is sometimes called little africa and the arab geographers knew it as the western island in many respects it is like an island it is the region of the atlas mountains surrounded on the west and north by the atlantic ocean and the mediterranean and on the south and east by that sea of sand known as the desert of sahara the country inside these boundaries is of enormous extent it is longer than the distance from new york to omaha and its average width is greater than the distance from washington to new york it comprises morocco algeria and tunis has an area as great as our atlantic states and supports millions of people this atlas region is wildly mountainous some of its peaks rise as high as the highest of the rockies it has skies as blue as those of colorado and the face of the country resembles new mexico and arizona some of it is dry and barren other parts are well watered by nature and others have been made fertile by irrigation the country is beautiful the mountains are covered with forests the valleys produce the same fruits and grains as southern europe and everywhere are great beds of daisies buttercups daffodils and irises the climate is excellent and suited to our race the natives of this part of africa belong to the same race as we do they are chiefly berbers or kabyles caucasian tribes which have lived here for ages many of them have fair complexions rosy cheeks blue eyes and light-colored hair other natives such as the moors or arabs are the descendants of the mohammedan warriors who conquered northern africa centuries ago and who are still the ruling classes throughout the country they are darker than the berbers but their features are similar to ours the moors are found mostly in the towns and lowlands there are jews in the cities and many negroes who were brought across the desert of sahara to be used as slaves we shall learn more about the people as we travel among them our first trip is to be through morocco just over the way we take a little steamer and within three hours have crossed the strait of gibraltar from europe to africa and have anchored in the port of tangier we are in a new world the bay where we lie is surrounded by hills at the foot of which is a little white city with great white walls about it those towers which rise here and there above the rest of the buildings 
are the minarets of the mohammedan churches or mosques where the priests are calling the people to prayers that tree which rises high above the flat roofs is a date palm and the big building at this end is the citadel while farther over is the kasbah or home of the governor of the province what an odd city its square houses with their flat roofs look like gigantic goods boxes jumbled together along narrow streets without regular order notice the swarthy brown-skinned men in turbans and gowns who are coming on board they are hotel porters you can see their names on their turbans each sings out the virtues of his own establishment as he seizes our baggage and begs us to follow we push back and make our own choice and then go to the shore where our baggage is examined by dark-faced officers in turbans and gowns we next take donkeys and ride to the hotel passing through the gate in the wall we go slowly guiding our little beast this way and that to keep out of the way of other donkeys loaded with goods or ridden by men now a mule passes and now we are overshadowed by camels moving along the streets are narrow and we are often crowded close to the wall there are no carts and all freight is carried on donkeys and camels the people are as strange as the animals the crowd reminds us of a sheet and pillowcase party or a great masquerade we are jostled by dark-faced moors in burnooses long cloaks with hoods which cover the head showing only the face and beard others have turbans and white gowns and some wear the red fez caps of morocco and the black clothes of europe many are barefooted others have slippers of bright yellow and red with soles so thin that they make little noise on the cobblestone roadway see those sallow-faced men in caps and long coats bound in at the waist with bright-colored sashes they are jews we shall meet thousands of them in morocco they do most of the banking and trading and many of them are rich they are despised by the moors and in some cities live in a quarter off by themselves look out for that water carrier or he will sprinkle you as he goes by i mean that man with the fat black bag of goatskin on his back all the water of tangier is carried either that way or in jars it comes from the springs and wells it is sold throughout the city water carrying being a regular trade what are those odd figures coming up the street they look like white bed ticks tied in at the top walking on feet they are moorish women who by mohammedan custom must keep their faces hidden from all men but their husbands see that girl at the right she has pulled her head cloth to one side and holds it there peeping out through the crack what is the singing in this side street at the left that is a class of arab children learning their lessons we follow the sound and peep in a half dozen dark-faced boys in caps and gowns are sitting on the floor of a room upon cushions before little low desks each has a book in his hand and are all singing out the verses of the koran or mohammedan bible which they are trying to learn the black-bearded man in the white turban is the teacher he has a little rod to keep his pupils in order and looks rather fierce those shoes near the door belong to the children they take off their shoes while in school although they keep their caps on there are many such schools in morocco and in fez the capital are universities which are noted all over northern africa leaving the school we go to the hotel where we have dinner served much as at home save that our waiters are little arabs in slippers wearing turbans and gowns later we visit the bazaars and then go outside the walls to the market where all sorts of goods are sold what a curious place it is like a great gypsy encampment there are little tents scattered over the fields and amongst them are men women and children sitting on the ground or moving about or standing in groups laughing and chatting buying and selling here two are quarrelling there one is pulling a donkey away from another and farther over are three long-gowned arabs loading their camels for a caravan trip across the desert the ungainly beasts are down on their knees and they groan and shed tears as each new burden is added that black-faced moor with the crowd about him is a professional storyteller the boy beyond him is peddling lemonade and those two well-dressed men coming this way are merchants buying goods for shipment abroad 
there are many women some with veils and some with bare faces and altogether such a variety of strange sights that we cannot comprehend them all and then the animals and especially the camels and donkeys they are everywhere we must look out for the camels they are treacherous beasts and may bite us as they pass we stop at the stand of a fruit peddler and buy figs oranges and dates we watch the men selling wool and grain and talk through our guides with some soldiers who have come in from the country after this we look up horses and mules for our trip to fez the northern capital of morocco which lies in the interior about ten days from tangier we try horse after horse to get the best riding animals and pick out the largest of the mules to carry our baggage End of chapter two chapter three of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b through interior morocco we have left tangier and are traveling on horseback through the land of morocco we have an escort of moorish soldiers furnished by the sultan to protect us from the wilder tribes and quite a caravan of pack mules to carry our baggage including the tents in which we shall rest at noon and at night our servants are dark-faced arabs in burnooses and our soldiers carry long guns and look fierce the men with the tents usually start first and when we reach the camping places the tents are already up and our meals are prepared we have plenty of canned food with us and we buy fresh fruits chickens eggs and milk at the villages and towns on the way our animals are fastened at night by tying their forefeet together with a long rope which is secured to a peg driven into the ground we start early each morning and walk gallop or trot as we please on the way the trail changes from time to time now we are in the mountains where the fierce berbers live they stare at us and evidently despise us because we are christians now we are on the plains in the farm villages of the arabs and now in towns somewhat like tangier where the chief people are moors how delightful it is the sky is bright blue and the air from the atlas mountains whose highest peaks are now covered with snow is pure and bracing there are no roads in morocco only caravan tracks and bridle paths and our way is right through the fields much of the land is rich and we ride for miles through crops of green barley wheat millet and corn now going over a plain spotted with daisies daffodils buttercups and irises and now through valleys where there are beautiful ferns and palmetto trees we see many fig orchards surrounded by prickly pear hedges and groves of dark green olive trees loaded with fruit farther up in the mountains are vineyards and lemon trees and orange trees there are also forests of walnut trees and of the evergreen oaks whose bark is used for corks throughout the world at times a great stork flies over us and again a flock of crows or an eagle the air is filled with buzzing beetles and other insects we catch butterflies when we camp and gather wild flowers to press and send home to our friends ripe dates and figs are brought us fresh from the trees and we stop at an orange orchard and pick some of the fruit at one place we visit a large fruit farm and see figs prepared for export to the united states and europe when the figs are dead ripe they are gathered and laid upon boards in the sun to dry when dry they are pressed into shape one by one and then packed in boxes or mats for shipment abroad morocco has many delicious figs some kinds are white some black some purple and others yellow or green the purple figs are among the best although the yellow ones are more beautiful fig trees are raised from seeds the sprouts are transplanted in rows so that they stand sixteen or more feet apart they begin to yield fruit at three years and some varieties will produce two crops a year for centuries figs are grown in different parts of northern africa in spain portugal greece and other countries upon the mediterranean sea and also in california there are altogether more than three hundred varieties of this fruit another valuable product of morocco is the olive 
we see olive orchards almost everywhere and watch the dark-skinned people gathering the fruit and pickling it or pressing it to make olive oil olives when first picked look much like blue or green plums the trees are set out not far apart and are carefully cultivated at about the eighth year after planting they come into bearing after which they will bear for a hundred years or more for this reason it is said that the man who sets out an olive orchard lays up an inheritance for his children's children some trees will yield forty gallons and some even one hundred gallons of olives in one year the fruit for pickling is gathered comparatively green that for oil remains on the tree until dead ripe in making oil the olives are spread on a floor of glazed tiles to let the water in them run off after this they are pressed yielding an oil which is the olive oil of commerce going onward we see strange things at every step we pass camels so loaded with grass that they look like hay stacks on legs there are many men in turbans and gowns and women with covered faces like those of tangier the people riding the camels bob up and down as the huge beasts swing themselves over the roads and those upon donkeys have their bare feet almost touching the ground as their little beasts patter along now a turbaned arab calls out to us alaikum salam which means peace be with you our guide tells us how to reply and we cry out as we bow salam alaikum with you be peace some of the natives however are by no means so friendly and were it not for our guard from the sultan we might have to fight now and then a company of fierce-looking arabs with long guns in their hands dashes by upon horseback they are mohammedans and are unfriendly to christians we pass through many villages of rude huts made of stone mud or straw each house has a wall or hedge of cactus about it many have dogs which bark at our horses as we ride by some of the villages are high up on the hills and some are on the plains many are partly composed of tents and some are all tents arranged in circles or squares the tents are the homes of shepherds who are pasturing their flocks moving on as the grass fails the shepherds wear hoods and long cloaks we hear them singing as they tend their sheep in the fields there are goats everywhere they are reared for their wool and skins now and then we cross brooks creeks or little rivers and at such places always find the people using the water to irrigate the fields they raise it to the higher levels by two wheels set at right angles to each other moving in cogs and connected with a third wheel which has clay jars tied to its rim this last wheel is so set that as it turns the jars dip into the water and fill as the jars come to the top they empty into a trough which leads out to the fields the motive power is usually a blindfolded ox camel or mule the farming of morocco is everywhere rude the ploughs have but one handle they are often little more than crooked sticks shod with iron which scratch the surface of the ground the farmers are poor they are heavily taxed the officials of the sultan leaving them little more than enough to support life going farther south we cross the Sebu river and a little later find ourselves on the green plain of fez we make our way over a country covered with palmetto trees and coarse grass now passing through beautiful wild flowers and rich crops until at last away off in the distance we see a white city it turns gray as we near it and we perceive a gray wall with towers upon it the domes and minarets of mosques rise high above the wall and we are told that we are in sight of fez the chief city of morocco and the home of the sultan for a part of each year it lies about one hundred miles back from the atlantic ocean in a pear-shaped valley surrounded by hills on which are orchards of orange pomegranate olive and apricot trees we meet more and more people as we come closer there are tents outside the walls and caravans of camels and donkeys going back and forth over the road aided by the escort of the sultan we pass through the crowd and enter the gates we are at last in fez the capital of morocco end of chapter three
chapter four of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b in fez the capital of morocco the empire of morocco is larger than any one of our states except texas it has several million inhabitants most of whom live in villages and desert encampments there are but few cities the largest is fez which is about the size of indianapolis and next to it is the town of morocco which lies south of it mckenniz to the westward is still smaller after mckenniz come the chief ports scattered along the atlantic coast embracing tangier casablanca or dar el beda mazagan and mogador the port towns are much like tangier each has a mosque or so a collection of flat-roofed bright-colored buildings and a market the streets are narrow and dirty and thronged with dark-skinned people in moorish costumes the trade to and from the ports is chiefly by camels or mules which cross the desert in great caravans to the oases and even to the tropical lands south of the sahara known as the sudan camels are the only animals which can travel long distances without water and they are extensively used for such journeys in the mountains donkeys horses and mules take their places the chief goods brought into morocco by sea are cottons sugar and tea and those sent away are the skins of sheep and goats the hides of cattle and also wool wax olive oil almonds and eggs but suppose we begin our exploration of fez we have hired a house in the city for our stay we have it all to ourselves with the exception of the turbaned long-gowned black-skinned servants who bring in our meals and take care of our beds the house has blank white walls facing the street we come into a court paved with tiles and lighted by a lantern of bright colored glass the court is surrounded by spacious rooms each of which has a low ledge running about the wall which serves as sofa and chairs we are expected to sit cross-legged and do so for a time but it is tiresome and we soon hang our legs down in the bedrooms there are wider ledges upon which we sleep at night the house is by no means uncomfortable the floors are of stone and are carpeted with beautiful rugs the high ceilings make the rooms cool and there is a fretwork of wood above each door for air in the evening we go upon the roof to sit or walk about the roof is flat it has a little wall around it on which we could stand to get a view of the city were it not impolite to do so the tops of moorish houses are the evening lounging places of the ladies and according to mohammedan custom it would not be proper for us to look at them we can see however that all fez is flat roofed the common buildings are uniformly low and the few which rise high above the rest are mosques which have great domes and minarets cutting the sky inside the walls of our house is a garden where there are palm orange and lemon trees tropical plants and beautiful flowers it is delightful and we feel that moorish life is not so bad after all we spend day after day strolling the streets how crowded they are the donkey riders and burden bearers are always calling to the others to keep out of their way the streets are so narrow that we have to jump from one side to the other we are careful not to offend any one for fez is a mohammedan city and many of its people do not like christians we walk by the mosques without going in the moors do not welcome unbelievers inside their churches and we are content with what we can see through the doors there are many worshippers some on their knees and some rising and falling and bowing their heads to the floor praying in the mohammedan way outside in the courts are fountains where turbaned long-gowned men are washing themselves before going in the mohammedan always washes himself before he prays and if he is out on the desert where he cannot get water he rubs his hands and face with sand every good mohammedan prays five times a day that man away up there on the gallery of the minaret is calling the people to prayers his words are in arabic but the guide tells us what they mean he is saying come to prayer come to prayer prayer is better than sleep come to prayer 
we visit the famous university for which fez is noted it has now seven hundred pupils and forty professors in addition the city has fourteen colleges and many small schools for more than a thousand years fez has been famous for its schools of learning the teaching however relates chiefly to the koran the mohammedan bible leaving out almost everything we consider essential to a good education let us go to the bazaars the business streets are roofed with matting or grapevines and we can stroll along out of the sun it seems almost twilight although we had the glare of a tropical midday outside the street is narrow and facing it are box-like stores most of which are little more than holes in the walls in each box a merchant sits or stands with his goods piled around him or hung upon racks overhead each man has his own kind of wares some are selling perfumery some rugs some spices and others the beautiful things in leather for which morocco is famous there are shoe stores and grocery stores cook shops where they are broiling meat upon iron skewers over basins of charcoal sweetmeat shops where candies and dried fruits are kept and other places where we buy delicious fresh dates and figs we watch men working at their trades in the shops here they are weaving silk and they are making the red fez caps which are worn in morocco as well as in turkey and egypt in a side street we see boys embroidering red leather slippers and across the way are smiths hammering at jewelry of silver and gold the customers are equally strange there are berbers from the mountains and fierce arabs who have come from the desert there are sheeted moorish women peeping out through cracks in their cloaks and with them jet-black negro slaves waiting to take home their purchases there are sober-faced boys and bearded men in burnooses all bargaining to buy as cheaply as they can the prices are not fixed and the merchant takes less than the sum he first asks during our stay we see the sultan as he rides through the city on horseback he has soldiers with him and goes about in great state he is not only emperor of morocco but also the head of the mohammedan religion in this part of the world he has absolute power over his people and can punish them as he pleases some of the punishments are cruel and the government is a barbarous one in our country taxes are fixed by congress the state legislatures and the local governments and the money collected is used for schools roads post offices the police and other things for the good of the people in morocco the sultan himself fixes the taxes and spends the money just as he pleases he has his officers in every district and even in many of the wandering tribes of the mountains and desert a few tribes claim to be independent and will not pay taxes unless compelled to do so the sultan keeps an army of twenty or thirty thousand men to enforce his commands and much of the tax money goes to them the greater part of the remainder is spent upon the court or stored away in the treasury of the sultan so that there is nothing left for improving the country as a result of this the cities of morocco have neither gas works nor water works there are no roads no railroads no public school system the land though rich in natural resources is but little developed and the people are poor End of chapter 4chapter five of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b algeria general view we have left fez and ridden on our horses back to the strait of gibraltar there we took passage on a ship and we have come about two hundred miles eastward to algeria the great country adjoining morocco belonging to france we are now in the most important of all the french colonies algeria is often called african france although it is not the only territory the french have on this continent they control tunis on the east much of the sahara on the south and parts of the sudan and the other countries beyond algeria is equal to five states as large as pennsylvania and it would cover the whole of france if it could be lifted up and spread over it it consists of the tell 
hilly lands along the coast and the rich plains and valleys between them and the atlas mountains of the high plateaus and valleys of the atlas furnishing excellent pasture and of the southern slope of the mountains covered with tracts of scanty vegetation which fade off into the sands of the sahara the tell is the best part of algeria it is a land of rich farms gardens orchards and vineyards it has many villages and it supports most of the people the native algerians are much like the moroccans there are many kabyles people of the white race some with rosy complexions and fair hair there are many brown-skinned arabs with black hair and eyes fine teeth and aquiline noses there are moors and negroes and jews mixed with the others the population all told is about five millions of whom all but a few hundred thousand are africans the others are frenchmen spaniards jews and italians the frenchmen are by far the most numerous of the europeans and they are steadily increasing in number but how did algeria become a possession of france the story is somewhat connected with the history of our country for more than ten centuries algeria tunis and tripoli were the homes of some of the greatest robbers on earth they were ruled by the barbary pirates moors who preyed upon the shipping of the mediterranean sea robbing and enslaving their captives they were so strong that other nations paid tribute to them in order that their ships might not be molested this was at the time we began to build up our commerce and for a while we also paid tribute in eighteen fifteen however the united states decided that it would submit to this imposition no longer and commodore decatur was sent out with some of our men of war to serve notice to the day of algiers the leader of the pirates that we would pay him tribute no more as the commodore gave this notice his guns were pointed at the city of algiers and the day saw he would have trouble in enforcing his demands so he suggested that the tribute might be omitted if the commodore would storm the town using powder only the day thought such a pretense would give him an excuse for not enforcing the tribute commodore decatur replied that cannonballs always went with american powder and that if the day took the one he must take the other the result was that all talk of tribute was dropped and the americans sailed away a little later the english refused to pay and in retaliation for outrages they laid algiers in ruins then came trouble with france and the day while discussing affairs with the french representative grew angry and struck him in the face with his fan that blow cost him his kingdom the french at once declared war they sent an army to algeria defeated the day and annexed the country to france this was in eighteen thirty and since then the french have been in possession they have made algeria one of the states or provinces of their republic it sends its own representatives to the congress at paris and as a governor-general and other french officials to rule it we shall find algeria far different from morocco there our travelling was on bridle paths and caravan tracks here it will be over roads and railroads french soldiers are everywhere and good order prevails in both town and country we begin our travels in oran the chief port of western algeria the boat from tangier lands us on a long pier and we take carriages for a drive through the town passing drays loaded with wine and donkey carts carrying all kinds of goods in morocco there were no vehicles whatever here we have excellent carriages and the streets are wide and well paved we drive by many fine buildings made of marble from the mountains near by they are european in style consisting of four or five stories with shops on the ground floors and hotels or apartments above the shops are like those of french cities there are many cafes facing the street with tables outside them about which africans and europeans are chatting as they drink coffee and wine farther back are white box-like buildings the homes of arabs and moors there are mosques with tall minarets and also christian churches in the native quarter are bazaars and all the queer features of oriental life the algerians are half african and half european here goes a jew with his cap and long coat tied in at the waist there is a moor in turban and gown 
and farther up street are berbers in from the country with fruit and vegetables for sale we see french soldiers in zouave uniforms with long tasseled caps on their heads and now and then a french lady as dainty as though she had stepped from the boulevards of paris into the queer streets of this african france there are moorish ladies in veils and jewish girls without veils there are berber women with arms and faces tattooed and altogether such a strange mixture of people that we are at a loss to class some of them and often wonder just who they are we spend a day or so at the hotel enjoying the excellent meals and then take the cars for the city of algiers the capital about two hundred and sixty miles to the eastward how delightful it is the sky is bright blue and the air from the mountains is bracing a great part of our journey is through the rich lands of the tell by plantations of tobacco wheat barley and oats and over plains covered with alpha grass which men are cutting and baling for shipment to europe where it will be made into paper here are orchards of apples peaches and pears and there ripe oranges peep at us through their yellow eyes out of the green there are trees loaded with dark purple figs and other trees full of light yellow lemons there are gnarly olive orchards bearing fruit like green plums and vast vineyards loaded with grapes used for making wine for export to france now we leave the plains for the mountains we ride for miles through forests of cork oaks where they are cutting the bark and baling it for export to be made into bottle stoppers and other such things there are sheep goats and camels feeding on the grass watched by shepherds and now and then a village of tents made of black and white cloth the homes of these men who move about with their flocks from pasture to pasture there are many villages in the tell including settlements inhabited by the french and in both mountain and valley are the little towns of the berbers the berbers are the most industrious people of northern africa they work for the french on the farms and in the cities they have also many small farms of their own scattered about the villages where they live their lands being so carefully divided that several families will often own a part of one petty tract now and then we leave the train to visit the villages the berbers are polite they show us their houses and make us at home the ordinary house has but one story and seldom more than one room in this room the people eat and sleep their bed is the ground and a sheepskin takes the place of a mattress the goats and sheep often sleep in the house with the family how dark it is the only light comes through the door for there are no windows that hole in the ground filled with ashes is where the cooking is done and everything is of the rudest description these people have their own customs they are mostly mohammedans but a berber seldom has more than one wife and the women go about without veils marriage is a business transaction a man always paying a price for his wife to her parents the berbers are among the oldest of the african peoples they have lived so long in this part of the world that no one knows just where they came from they have fought again and again for their rights having been conquered by the phoenicians romans vandals and moors before the french came they are now divided into many tribes and are still to a great extent their own rulers each village is a little republic governed by its head men who make the laws and appoint officers to carry them out the people are proud of their tribes and the man who brings disgrace on his tribe must leave it and his house is torn down they are prospering under the protection of the french their children attend the french schools and they are advancing in civilization and wealth end of chapter five chapter six of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. In Algiers. We begin our travels this morning with a walk through Algiers, the capital of African France. We are in one of the largest cities on the African coast. It is an important port of the Mediterranean Sea. Our hotel is on a broad boulevard facing the harbor. There are large buildings all about us, containing fine stores restaurants and cafes on the ground floor 
with offices and dwellings above those huge structures nearer the water are warehouses the harbor is full of vessels the boats lie inside two walls of stone which enclose several hundred acres of water so deep that the largest ocean steamers can come in without danger the ships are all from parts of the mediterranean sea from the european ports on the atlantic and even from china and japan by way of the suez canal there are more french ships than any other for the chief trade of algeria is with the mother country notice the steamer now coming in the black smoke rolling in volumes out of its funnel that is the regular boat from marseilles it left there twenty-seven hours ago with its load of mail passengers and freight one of those boats arrives every day forming the chief connection between france and its african colony we stroll down to the edge of the harbor and watch the loading and unloading of goods there are ships from london taking off coal and others bound for that port loading alpha grass wheat cork dates and wines there are french steamers bringing in flour meat and fruit and smaller boats from spain italy greece and other countries about there is a sailing vessel from boston with a cargo of salt fish and a steamer from argentina with jerked meat to be sold to the inhabitants of the tell and the regions beyond it we can easily see that algiers has a large trade and that algeria is commercially important to the markets of the world turning our steps from the harbor we go on up into the city the streets of the lower part of it are wide and well paved the avenues are shaded by palms and there are statues here and there we pass the public buildings and then stop at the great mosque it is an enormous white structure covering several acres built about a court in which there are trees and a fountain the turban priest on the minaret is calling out the hour of prayer and we take up our shoes and walk in there are many arabs moors and other mohammedans inside some are standing some kneeling and some bowing their heads to the ground as they go through their prayers we notice that their faces are all turned the same way they are looking toward the east for the mohammedan always prays with his face toward mecca which is in that direction outside in the courtyard we see long-gowned men washing their hands and feet we make our way up the hill algiers is built in the shape of an amphitheater its streets rising terrace above terrace the french quarter is down near the harbor the arabs moors negroes and other native africans live farther up their houses are flat roofed with white walls and with but few windows facing the street the streets are narrow some of them are devoted to the bazaars being roofed over with matting and walled with small stores in which men are sitting or standing selling all kinds of goods the shops are larger than in fez but nevertheless little more than holes in the wall and the customers stand in the street as they buy each branch of merchandise has its quarter one bazaar is devoted to the shoemakers here we see slippers and shoes some made of bright colored leather and turned up at the toes another street is taken up by the jewelers and in another men are selling the perfumery of which the mohammedans are so fond we buy some delicious attar of roses a drop of which will perfume one's trunk for a month and then go on to shops containing beautiful carpets and rugs stopping at a cafe to drink some turkish coffee which is as sweet as molasses and almost as thick as we sit we watch the strange crowd passing by we are at a corner where we can observe the people as they go in and out of the bazaars and ride to and fro the crowd is typical of algiers the meeting place of europe there are french soldiers in zouave uniforms and tourists from england and america in white suits and cork hats there are spaniards italians and french of all classes we see arabs in their long gowns dark-skinned bedouins just in from the desert fierce-looking berbers from the mountains and turbaned moors egyptians and turks every one has his own dress from that greek sailor in petticoats to the negro porter behind him wearing almost no clothes whatever there are women as well as men french ladies in parisian costume jewish girls in long straight gowns of pink red green or yellow 
moorish women so veiled that we can see only their eyes and rosy-cheeked berber maids with bare faces there are boys with shaved heads and gowns and skull-caps and half-naked babies carried along in the arms of their mothers leaving the cafe we go into the streets inhabited by the richer algerians the doors of some of the houses are open and we can look in they are built around courts in which fountains are playing and over which matting is often stretched to keep out the sun the floors of such houses are marble and the walls are beautifully carved the people often sit in the court and sometimes eat there about the court are the kitchen the bath and the storerooms the usual sitting or sleeping rooms are upstairs and above them are the roofs where the women go on pleasant days to take the air and to gossip and chat we do not see the mohammedan women they have their quarters apart from the men of the family and it would not be thought polite for boys to ask to go in this is the case in all mohammedan countries the faces of the women being seen only by their fathers and brothers or very near relatives the women always wear veils up to their eyes when out on the streets at home they take off their veils and usually go about barefooted or in slippers the children of the richer classes are well clad they are bright little ones and seem to have as much fun as we do algerian girls are often married at twelve or thirteen years of age and at twenty a woman is thought to be an old maid according to the mohammedan religion one man may have four wives but many of the moors and arabs have but one each leaving algiers we go by railroad to the city of constantine in the eastern part of the country travelling for miles through vineyards where the berbers are at work picking grapes and making them into the wine for which the country is noted much of the way is across a plain with ranges of mountains in view we see arabs ploughing the fields using donkeys mules and sometimes oxen or camels the ploughs are crooked sticks shod with iron and they appear small when drawn by the camels on our way through the mountains we look in vain for the numidian lions which were so famous in the days of old rome they were caught here and carried to italy for the gladiatorial shows the lion has almost disappeared from this part of the world the country is beautiful especially in the mountains we pass many natural wonders and when we come to constantine itself we look at it again and again for we have never heard of a city like this before constantine stands upon a rocky plateau at an elevation of eighteen hundred feet above the sea the plateau is only about two miles in circumference and it is surrounded on all sides by a ravine which is from fifteen feet to four hundred feet wide and in some places six hundred feet deep through the ravine a rushing river flows and the rock itself upon which constantine stands is connected with the mainland by a narrow isthmus much like the natural bridge of virginia iron bridges have also been built across the ravine and we ride over one of them into the city more than fifty thousand people live upon this rock and do business here constantine is the commercial centre of eastern algeria although it is about fifty miles south of the mediterranean sea it is noted for its embroideries in leather its shoes saddles and harness and also for its hakes and burnooses of which more than one hundred thousand are made every year the city has its french and native quarters it has a strong garrison for it is a natural fortification and there are many soldiers marching about we call upon the governor visit the great mosque and spend some time in the bazaars buying curios to send to our friends we notice that good order is everywhere kept and cannot help contrasting the excellent condition of algeria under the french with the barbarism of morocco as ruled by the sultan End of chapter six chapter seven of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the city of tunis we have come by railroad from constantine to the city of tunis the capital of tunis and the largest city in africa with the exception of alexandria and cairo 
tunis is almost as large as wisconsin with a population of about two millions it is like parts of algeria and the inhabitants are not very different it is under the protection of the french and we shall meet many french officials and soldiers the country still has a native ruler called the bay but his powers are few and he has to do as the french governor directs on our way to the city of tunis we ride by rich pastures upon which donkeys sheep cattle and camels are feeding watched by men women and children we pass many fields of wheat barley and oats where dark-skinned people are cultivating the crops frequently seeing a great ungainly camel drawing a plough now we are in mountains where there are forests of cork trees and now in valleys spotted with olive orchards fig trees and groves of date palms when our train stops at a station arab women bring fresh water and fruit to the cars and we lay in a stock of oranges figs and dates to eat on the train the track winds its way in and out through the valley of a small river and passing over a wide plain spotted with brackish lakes brings to our view the great white flat-roofed city of tunis tunis is situated on an isthmus between two shallow salt lakes not far from the gulf of tunis it is connected with the gulf by a canal so that ships come right through to the town the city proper is almost surrounded by walls and at its back are hills covered with villas and gardens it has four wide streets and we drive in carriages from the railroad station to the hotel there we leave our baggage and start out for a donkey tour of exploration each of us has an arab boy running behind to urge on his steed and we go on the gallop from one part of the place to another tunis has a population of about two hundred thousand made up of moors arabs turks egyptians negroes jews and people from europe and the islands of the mediterranean we make our way through the french quarter which is like similar parts of the algerian cities and then direct our donkey boys to take us through the maltese jewish and arab quarters and then on into the bazaars how interesting it is we are riding in and out of a throng of people as curiously clad as in a great masquerade notice that strange creature dressed all in white with a black veil hiding almost the whole front of her person now she holds up the veil with both hands and peeps out below it making her way through the streets without her face being seen she is a mohammedan and therefore hides her face from all men but her husband the fat woman a little farther on in jacket and trousers with no veil at all is a jewess she is the wife of a rich merchant and her excessive plumpness is counted a sign of beauty and wealth the man behind her with the heavy black rope tied around his head is an arab and the hooded man with him is a moor see how that great bearded turk in the black gown green turban and red slippers is scowling at us he is a mohammedan sheik and he does not like christians green was the favorite color of the prophet mohammed and the sheik has the right to wear that turban because he has been to mecca where mohammed was born there are many berbers that tall gaunt arab has just come in from the desert and those two jet-black negroes were probably brought across the sahara in caravans and sold in tunis as slaves there are also olive-skinned italians and greeks and rosy-cheeked people from malta a little island in the mediterranean not far away the streets are narrow and we are often crowded close to the walls now it is by a camel with a great load of wood and now by a donkey carrying fruit or dirty pigskins filled with oil we are jostled by the mules of rich arabs in turbans and gowns and we have to look out for the blind men who pick their way with their staffs in all parts of northern africa there are many blind people the sun is so dazzling that it hurts the eyes and flies and other insects cling to the eyelids sometimes causing the loss of sight now we stop at the stand of an arab who sells sweetmeats and candy and now at a booth where a long-gowned man is frying meat and selling it hot from the fire here a letter writer is working away beside him is a jew money changer and farther on are several fruit peddlers with fresh dates oranges and figs 
we are now in the bazaars where the narrow streets are covered with matting or boards there is no breeze and the air at times is terribly hot the merchants have their goods in little cave-like holes facing the street each street has its wares some being devoted to tailors others to saddlers to rug sellers and to ironmongers there is much work going on here they are weaving silk wool or cotton there men and boys are working in brass and farther on they are embroidering leather we pause in one bazaar where a woman is buying henna to stain her fingernails and toenails red for she thinks that color most beautiful and at another we watch the merchants dealing out perfumes so costly that they are sold by the drop we often stop to price curios to take home to our friends the turban dealers ask us to drink coffee with them and we sit cross-legged on the floors of their stores and sip the rich brown liquid as we bargain together one of the merchants is very friendly and at his invitation we go with him to his house he takes us in and out through the winding streets and stops at last before a square white building in which slits take the place of windows the front door is richly carved we first enter a court surrounded by marble columns behind which are the rooms of the house there are soft rugs on the floors and wide divans about the walls our host motions us to take seats with him on the divans in oriental fashion we do so and by and by black-skinned white-gowned servants bring in trays of candies and sherbet the latter is a syrup which we eat with a spoon it is almost as thick as molasses and is delicious the little sons of our host come in and he presents them to us the boys cling to their father's knee as they look at us with wondering eyes he caresses them and we see that mohammedans are quite as fond of their children as our parents are of us at the end of our call we go to the jewish quarter here the men wear fez caps or turbans and gowns most of them shave the head leaving only a tuft of hair on the top the women wear trousers at home and on dress occasions some have velvet pantaloons decorated with silver or gold coins and bangles a girl may thus wear her whole fortune on her clothes is it not strange to see men in gowns and women in trousers on our way back to the hotel we visit some of the schools which have been established by the french they are to be found throughout tunis tunis has also a mohammedan university and mohammedan primary schools where young arabs and moors study the koran as well as the french language and other things we have already learned that northern africa has had an important part in the history of the world tunis and algeria were once the home of the phoenicians one of the greatest of the ancient nations and right here near tunis was carthage their most famous city carthage was so large that the wall around it was twenty-three miles long there were towers in the wall and casements in which were stabled three hundred elephants and four thousand horses for use in war the city was situated on a beautiful bay divided into two harbors it had docks for several hundred merchant ships and its vessels of war had iron beaks which could be driven into the ships of the enemy for a long time there were wars between carthage and rome the romans found the carthaginians such brave fighters that they decided that there would always be trouble unless carthage was destroyed after many defeats they succeeded in conquering the carthaginians and burned their city they even ploughed up the ground upon which it stood and made it into pastures where their sheep and goats fed watched by roman slaves later still tunis and algeria produced so much wheat that they became known as the granary of rome this place however was well fitted for a city and as time went on the romans re-established carthage and it again became great it was afterward torn to pieces by the vandals and finally destroyed by the mohammedans the site of this ancient city is only nine miles away and we drive out for a look at its ruins the vast buildings have all disappeared hardly one stone has been left upon another except in the old cisterns which supplied the city with water we find only a few bits of marble or earthenware among the ruins to take home as relics and we learn that the stones of the ancient palaces were used to build tunis and that for ages ships came here from italy 
and other parts of the mediterranean sea to carry away the marble columns mosaic floors bricks and beautiful tiles as we wander along the shores of the bay we try and picture to ourselves the boys and girls who sported here ages ago when tunis belonged to one of the world's greatest peoples End of chapter 7chapter eight of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the desert of sahara our journeys for the next few weeks are to be in the desert we have been near it many times since we landed at tangier but we shall now venture far out into this vast region of rock and sand with the exception of the parts of morocco algeria and tunis which we have explored and the long narrow valley of the nile farther eastward almost the whole of northern africa is taken up by the sahara the longest continuous desert on earth it is one of a series of deserts which extends throughout asia into africa and clear across that continent to the atlantic ocean the sahara is so vast that if four mighty giants could lift it up at the corners and drop it down upon our country it would not only cover it but in places would extend out into canada and the mexican gulf from west to east its thirsty length is so great that no explorer has been able to cross it in that direction and its width from north to south is greater than the distance from the atlantic ocean to the rocky mountains on the north it extends in some places to the mediterranean sea and on the south it loses itself in the sudan a wide belt of rich well-watered land which crosses africa extending southward to the fertile regions of the river congo the sudan has a luxuriant growth of grass and trees it is peopled by blacks of many tribes who are largely supplied with goods carried across the sahara but what kind of a country is this vast desert region the word sahara which comes from the arabic means uninhabited wilderness this hardly describes the sahara for parts of it are inhabited these are the oases situated about wells and springs where the land for a small space blossoms like the rose each oasis has its little settlement shaded by date palms and other trees there are so many of them that their people all together number hundreds of thousands in general however the sahara is a waste of dry land cut by dry mountain chains with many valleys and dry beds of rivers running this way and that here it consists of a vast plain of sand there the land rises in a rocky plateau and miles farther on are bleak and bare mountains as ragged and stony as our rockies here the sand has blown and drifted into dunes or hills much as the snow drifts in our northern states and there the plain is covered with pebbles and boulders smooth round stones of many colors some people look upon the desert as all low flat and sandy this is not the nature of much of the sahara for the most part it is lofty plateaus the average height of the land being more than a quarter of a mile above the mediterranean sea the desert is often called a sea of sand we might better describe it as a billowy ocean of rock and sand tossed by the storms of time into all sorts of shapes if the sahara were all waste there could be no travelling through it here and there along the northern and southern edges is a scanty vegetation furnishing pasture for camels and sheep other regions are so green during parts of the winter and spring that the wandering tribes drive their animals there to feed and the oases are islands of green in this dry ocean made fertile by the water from springs wells underground streams or hollows in the beds of wadis that is rivers which are dry most of the year in some of the wadis are stunted trees and on the desert itself one often finds ragged plants bristling with thorns the oases have date palms and lemon orange peach apricot and other fruit trees they grow wheat barley vegetables and beautiful flowers it is the lack of moisture only that makes the sahara a desert its soil is for the most part so rich 
that where watered it produces as well as our western prairies or india siam hawaii and the west indies which are luxuriant well watered lands in about the same latitude but why is this great tract without water we ask the moisture-laden winds from the northwest are squeezed dry by the cold atlas mountains and those from the south and east are already dry before they reach the sahara in the winter the winds blow from the desert outward while in the summer when they blow inward the sun acting upon the sand and rock makes the air so hot that it evaporates the moisture before it can form into drops and fall as rain the result is that the winds of the desert are dry winds and the storms which are terrible at times are sandstorms which dash themselves against the rocks and scour them making more sand the air is hot in the daytime but cold at night this expands and contracts the rocks so that they split wear out and gradually fall to pieces thus the face of the desert is constantly changing if a few showers of rain fall anywhere plants spring up and for a time there is a bed of green dotted with flowers in some places water collects under the sand so that artesian wells can be made and irrigated oases formed by them the french have many such wells in the arid lands south of algeria and have thereby made fertile spots upon which groves of date palms and other things are growing the land here is so rich that the arabs say if you plant a stick in the desert and water it you will soon have a tree End of chapter eight chapter nine of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b in the oasis of biskra leaving tunis we return by train to constantine and go southward through the mountains of algeria into the desert on the railroad which the french have built to the oasis of biskra as we approach the sahara the country grows more barren and the pasture more scanty now and then we go by a mean arab village half tents half hovels with a flock of sheep or goats grazing near it watched by ragged men or boys we pass brackish lakes or salt marshes startling the wild geese and red-legged flamingos feeding upon them we shoot in and out of tunnels and go through a wild gorge into an oasis shaded by date palms of dark green farther on stretching away on both sides of the track we pass through more sand and rock and finally dash into biskra one of the most thriving oases of the sahara and the chief one accessible by railroad how delightful it is and how curious we are in the midst of the desert in a green valley so small that we can walk from one end of it to the other in an hour and across it in fifteen minutes or less all about us is the dry barren sand we see bare yellow mountains away off at the north and an oasis here and there standing out against other parts of the horizon biskra itself is delightfully green it has thousands of date palms with olive groves and orchards of oranges lemon apricot and other trees under them in some places vegetables are growing below the fruit trees so that there are three crops one rising above another upon the same ground the oasis is watered by springs it is divided into little farms each with a mud wall about it the farmers living in a village not far away here and there is a well out of which the water is raised by creaking wheels moved by camels and emptied into troughs which extend into the fields each farmer has the right to a fixed amount of the water the town of biskra where most of the people live is surrounded by a wall and a ditch it is the seat of government of the vast territories which the french own in the algerian sahara and it has many frenchmen and italians mixed with its arabs bedouins and moors biskra is more like the towns of algeria and tunis than the other oases settlements we shall visit in our caravan rides over the desert its streets are wide and well paved it has a park where the band plays every afternoon and a fort with french soldiers it has french stores as well as arab bazaars 
and also hotels for many europeans come to biskra for their health during the winter the natives here in the desert are even more strange than those of the north many of them are jet black the men are fierce-looking straight and well-formed the women are for the most part unveiled they dress in gay colors and wear great earrings bracelets and anklets of gold and silver some have just come in from the desert and we frequently meet a woman riding a camel bobbing up and down as she goes through the street biskra is an important trading center caravans come here from all parts of the sahara bringing dates and other products from the oases to be shipped off to europe and taking back all sorts of goods in exchange we see long lines of camels loaded with dates swinging their way through the streets and learn that dates are one of the chief products of this part of the world an oasis is valuable according to the number of date trees it will support there are almost two hundred thousand such palms in biskra and so many dates are brought in every year that if they were evenly divided there would be enough to give a big handful to every boy and girl in the united states we stroll about the oasis talking through our interpreters with the arab farmers and learning how dates are grown we pick some from the younger trees and bite into them the ripe dates are delicious but the green ones pucker our mouths like unripe persimmons the date palm although it thrives on the dry air of the desert must have plenty of water about its roots or it will die the arabs call it the queen of trees and say it must have its head in the burning sun and its feet in running water for this region the orchards are irrigated and ditches are dug around the trees to keep the roots moist when other crops are planted under the palms the whole field is flooded the date tree is usually grown from one of the suckers which sprout from the trunks of the older trees the suckers are taken off and planted if well watered they strike root at once and within four or five years begin to have fruit they are in full bearing at about eleven years after which they will yield a hundred pounds or more of dates a year for about a century in the sahara the date palm begins to blossom in april great bunches of beautiful flowers sprouting out of its top after a time the blossoms fall and the green dates appear as the summer goes on they change to a reddish or yellowish color and grow brighter and brighter until they are ripe when the yellow dates are the color of amber and the red dates are brownish or black as the fruit ripens the flesh which was unpleasant to the taste changes and becomes so sweet that in some varieties more than half of it is pure sugar the dates shipped to our country are sweet dates they are allowed to dry on the trees they shrink as they dry and after a week or so are ready to be picked and packed for the market dates are exported in bags or long wooden boxes the choicest varieties being repacked before they go to europe or the united states dates are of as many varieties as apples more than one hundred different kinds are grown in the sahara some are hard some soft some sweet and others so dry that one cannot bite into them those exported to the united states are of the soft variety they are so full of juice that it is often drained off before the fruit is packed the date juice forms a thick syrup which is eaten as a preserve under the name of date honey other dates do not dry readily although they contain less sugar these might be called table dates as they are often eaten fresh from the trees another and very important variety is the dry date this contains but little sugar and it is not soft or sticky when ripe it is allowed to remain on the tree until it drops and when stored away in a dry place can be kept for years dry dates are almost unknown outside the sahara but they form one of the chief foods of the people they might be called the bread of the desert they are eaten by man and beast being often fed to camels and even to dogs we delight in the ripe dates and find we can eat great quantities of them and still long for more they are grown in all the oases and will form a part of our food for some time to come going from the little farms on through the walls into the city of biskra we stroll about visiting the bazaars and the markets arranging for our caravan trip out into the desert there are long lines of camels always coming into biskra from many parts of the sahara and we have no trouble in selecting a party 
of well-guarded arabs with whom we can travel we are especially careful in picking our camels to choose good riding animals we try the different beasts again and again until we get some which ride almost as easily as rocking horses and are so fleet that they can we are told travel a hundred miles in one day end of chapter nine chapter ten of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b a caravan ride we have left biskra and are far out on the desert moving slowly along in a great caravan bound southward through the central sahara at the front on fast racing camels are the chiefs of the tribes which make up the caravan they have guns in their hands and are watching out for the robber bands so common throughout the sahara behind are the freight camels scarred dingy and sullen heavily loaded with all sorts of merchandise bound in with ropes long-gowned arabs so shrouded in white or brown that we can see only their faces are swinging to and fro on these ungainly beasts there are native women and children in our party and among them a dark-skinned mother holding a baby there are people walking as well as riding and a score of dogs are trotting beside us some of the camels are loaded with pigskins of water and others carry jugs of oil crates and boxes of cloth and great bundles of dates we have a goodly supply of food on the animals hired especially for us and also some skin water bottles the water keeps cool owing to the evaporation of that which oozes through the skin but it tastes of the bag and sickens us so that it is some time before we can drink it without making wry faces our route through the desert is from oasis to oasis there is neither path nor road and our guides make their way from one watering place to another by the stars or by rocks hills or other marks on the landscape arranging the marches so that we have a well or spring by which to camp almost every night the camels are made to kneel down when we stop and their loads are taken off their feet are carefully examined to see if they've been torn by the rocks and if so the skin is sewed together or patches of leather or rags are wrapped about them they are then hobbled by tying one leg up at the knee to keep them from running away we next pitch our tents and smooth the soft sand out for a bed a fire is made from the wood we carry with us and we cook our meals on the coals we arrange the camp so as to be ready to fight if attacked and go to bed with our guns within reach during our travels it is sometimes terribly hot the sun beats down out of a cloudless sky it strikes the white sand and throws the glare back into our faces the camels raise a thick dust and we wipe our blue spectacles again and again we fasten cloths about our heads with slits for the eyes and nose we laugh at one another we all look so strange our camels jolt us notwithstanding they are good riding animals they swing along with a motion like that of a ship on the waves we grow seasick but this passes off as in time does the terrible pain at our waist caused by our bobbing up and down all day we start early each morning and at noon are glad to stop under the shadow of some precipice or rocky hill to rest one day our camping place is surrounded by red sand and on another we are in the midst of attractive small pebbles red brown white and black they are smooth and shiny and we want some to carry back home we have taken off our shoes and stockings while resting and start to walk over the pebbles in our bare feet we jump back with cries of pain the stones are as hot as fire it feels like walking on coals now we are starting again the freight camels grunting and crying as they are forced to get up with their loads they growl as they move onward and are so angry that we fear to go near them lest they should bite how oppressive the air is there is not a breath stirring but look see that black cloud coming up away off at the east how fast it grows it has already shrouded half the sky it is bringing a wind with it which throws the sand into our faces the sandstorm increases 
some of the grains are as large as peas it is a veritable stone hail we are in the midst of one of the great storms of the desert our arab friends have stopped the caravan they have made the camels kneel on the sand and they direct us to lie down with our faces to the ground by the side of the camels and wait for the storm to blow over now the clouds have covered the heavens the rain of sand hides the sun we dare not open our eyes the camels are moaning they have thrust their noses into the ground and they blow out sand as they breathe see it grows lighter the storm is passing it is gone and the sky is again bright we rise and shake ourselves the sand rolling off as though it were snow some of the grains have got in at our collars and as they move about over our bodies they make us so uncomfortable that we sit very uneasily for the rest of the day we are reminded of the girl in the fairy tale who felt a pea through seven feather beds in our case the peas are sand bullets and they lie close to the skin the sahara has frequent storms of this kind it has some which last for days when the air is intensely hot and the sand blows into every crack and crevice of the homes on the oases and almost buries the caravans moving over the desert the best time for traveling is after the sun has gone down and the stars and moon rise then the temperature rapidly falls and it soon becomes so cold that we put on our overcoats and are glad to throw a blanket over our legs the air is now fresh and bracing it is clear and the whole dome of the sky is as visible as on the sea how bright the stars shine and how big the moon seems they appear to be closer to earth than at home our guides seem better natured at night and they tell us all sorts of stories of life on the desert they describe the rich oasis of tafalet in the western sahara talk about chad the great lake in the south and a terrible stony waterless wilderness not far from our route which it requires days to cross they speak of the wonderful caravans which go from fez in morocco to timbuktu in the sudan saying that some of them have a thousand camels guarded by five hundred men and that a caravan often carries a fortune in goods these caravans take all sorts of merchandise from europe across the desert and bring back ivory gold dust ostrich feathers gums wax and other such things in exchange an important part of the trade of the western sahara is salt which comes from the mines of rock salt in that region the salt is dug out in large lumps and trimmed into blocks about a yard long and half a yard wide in which shape they can be easily loaded upon camels the salt miners live not far from the mines they build their homes of blocks of rock salt roofing them with camel skins they rely for their water on an oasis some distance away the arabs describe the different caravan routes across the sahara showing us that the best of them are as well known as our highways at home these routes cross the desert from the ports on the mediterranean sea to the chief centers of population in the sudan there are five routes especially noted and these connect morocco algeria and tripoli on the north with timbuktu sokoto kano and other places on the south in a trip like ours the freight camels go no faster than a man can walk and it would take us about three months to travel from one side of the sahara to the other now the french are planning to extend the railroad from biskra southward to the sudan and thus connect that vast country with the mediterranean sea as we go on we pass caravans loaded with dates wool and other products on their way north each is guarded by arab warriors on camels for it is dangerous to travel through the desert unarmed from day to day we meet men of the different peoples who inhabit the sahara they are divided into three classes tribes who live in tents of camel's hair cloth and go about from place to place driving their camels and other animals with them the tueregs bands of warriors who might be called the robbers of the sahara and those who live in the oases the first two classes are wanderers the third the oases people are farmers who cultivate all sorts of vegetables tobacco cotton grain and barley as well as date palms and other fruits the natives of the sahara are almost all mohammedans controlled by their sheiks or priests 
we find mosques in the larger oases and observe that the arabs of our caravan say their prayers five times a day they kneel down in the desert with their faces toward mecca and pray to god in the name of mohammed as we wind our way in and out across the sands we see a band of tureggs now and then we treat them politely and as our force is a large one they do not attack us the tureggs are supposed to be the descendants of berbers who in times past were crowded out into this wilderness from the fertile north lands and who now make robbery and brigandage their trade they are scattered throughout the sahara and are noted for their cruelty cunning and quarrelsomeness we can easily distinguish the tureggs long before they come to us we know them by their fast riding camels their odd costumes and their weapons they have swords and lances and such clothes that they look more like women than men every warrior has a black veil over his face which hides all but his fierce dark eyes he does not take his veil off except at night and some of the chiefs are said to wear their veils night and day he wears a red cloth cap with a black tassel a long white shirt with a black blouse embroidered with gold or silver and wide turkish trousers the tureggs usually attack caravans when they are camping about the wells or at an oasis where the camels are scattered they sometimes come in disguise and hire out as guides so that they can join in surprising the caravan when their fellows come up they are mohammedans but are not strict in keeping their religion they seldom have more than one wife each and the women do not wear veils their chief wealth is in camels and horses they rear the finest of animals treating them as children rather than beasts the baby camel is often brought up with the children it sometimes sleeps in the tent and has a bite to eat with the family traveling onward we come upon an encampment of bedouins one of the tribes which wanders from oasis to oasis with its camels living in tents the women grind some meal for us and give us cakes and bread and couscous a dish of millet and meat which is one of their favorite foods they are very polite and we enjoy talking with them through our interpreter at one camp the chief asks us to dine with him the cloth is laid on the sand and we sit down upon cushions about it each of us has a spoon and knife but no fork we see that our host eats with his fingers and we do likewise the food is highly spiced and some is so hot with red pepper that it brings tears to our eyes the chief dish is a kid roasted whole it has been cooked on a pole running through it being thus held over the fire it is brought to the table with the pole still inside it we each cut off a slice and tear the meat apart with our fingers from time to time during the meal sweets are brought in and at its close coffee is served in little cups not bigger than half an eggshell the coffee is as thick as molasses and almost as sweet end of chapter ten chapter eleven of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b tripoli and its oases so far our travels have been in the western and central sahara which are more or less under the protection of france the french claim all the desert between their possessions of algeria and tunis and the territories they own in the sudan which take up almost to the whole western part of that country their desert lands are so vast that they cannot govern all of them so that many of the wandering tribes do about as they please the land east of the french possessions belongs to tripoli a country ruled by mohammedans under the protection of turkey and south of this is the dreary waste of the libyan desert which is so barren that the great nations of europe do not care to possess it we make our way in caravans from the algerian sahara across into tripoli stopping first at the thriving oasis of gadamis which lies about three hundred miles south of the mediterranean sea this oasis has one of the oldest towns of the sahara it was well known in roman times and it now has several thousand inhabitants entering the wall of gadamis we find ourselves in a maze of covered streets so dark that they have been compared to the tunnels 
of coal mines in many places the houses are built over the streets the stores being in the tunnels below the flat roofs of the houses are the favorite lounging places of the people during the evening we wind our way through one narrow vault after another talking to the arabs negroes and berbers who are working or idling or buying and selling at the shops we go to the gardens outside finding them watered by artesian wells and then take a look at the farms near by with their beautiful green patches of wheat barley and millet we enjoy the fresh dates figs and apricots and also the camel's meat and camel's milk which are served at our meals Gadamus is a caravan center it is situated at the great crossroads of the desert and has communication by camel route with the sudan the city of tripoli and different parts of the sahara we join a caravan which is about leaving for fezan a sandy waste in the province of tripoli dotted with little oases here we travel for days now surrounded by monotonous sand and rocks and now resting in an oasis under the date palms listening to the cooing of doves and the other birds which live in the trees we visit murzuk a town hundreds of years older than boston or new york it has only seven thousand inhabitants but it is an important place in this part of the world because it is on the route between the sudan and tripoli just where caravans can stop for water muzuk is neither cheerful nor healthful a traveller who once visited it thus referred to it how can one live where not a drop of rain falls where not a single dish is to be had where butter can no more be procured than the philosopher's stone where wheat is the diet of kings alone where the common man lives on dates and fever has its headquarters muzurk was at one time a centre of the slave trade and slaves are still secretly sold here they are brought across the sudan by arab dealers and thence taken on to tripoli for sale to the moors it is said that the route from the sudan to murzuk may be traced by the bones of the slaves who have died on the way now we have left fazan and are travelling northward to the city of tripoli we find frequent oases but along most of the way it is so barren that no animals can live before we came into the sahara we feared that we might meet lions leopards and other wild beasts which are said to infest this terrible wilderness we discover that this is a mistake animals must have water and food and the greater part of the sahara is so arid that it has no animal life whatever the lion although called the king of the desert seldom ventures far out from the cultivated and well-watered lands he is found in the sudan and now and then in the atlas mountains but not in the desert itself it is the same with leopards jackals hyenas foxes and gazelles along the edges of the sahara there are ostriches and in the oases are birds of many kinds as well as turkeys and chickens some of the oases have donkeys horses and cattle the camel lives on every green tract and it forms the chief beast of burden it is noted for its hardiness and its ability to travel a long distance without water or food it is the most important of all desert animals furnishing milk and meat and doing all sorts of work in addition to carrying its owner and his goods over the sands we meet more and more caravans as we approach tripoli the vegetation increases in extent and variety the plants which were stunted far out in the sand are taller and more luxuriant and they have fewer thorns by and by we get out of the desert into the cultivated country which runs along the coast and stop at last at tripoli the capital the city has about forty thousand people it is much like the towns we saw in algeria it lies right on the sea and is made up of square white buildings with flat roofs above which the domes of mosques are to be seen tripoli is surrounded by a huge wall which is guarded by soldiers who belong to the regiments encamped at the south of the town we leave our caravans and after engaging rooms at the hotel take a walk through the streets we are dusty from our long ride over the desert and decide to have a bath in moorish style there are many bathhouses in all mohammedan towns and we have little trouble in finding one in tripoli the first room we enter has couches scattered upon it 
upon each of which a man or boy is lying wrapped in a white cloth some of the boys are sleeping others look curiously at us we are led into a side room where two negroes undress us giving each a cotton towel to wrap about him and a pair of slippers to protect his feet the negroes then take us into another room floored with stone which is so filled with steam that we can hardly see one another our guides lead us each to a bench and tell us to sit down we do so but jump up with a cry the bench is burning hot made so by the steam we try it again sinking down gingerly and after a time find it quite comfortable as we sit there our bodies grow hotter and hotter and the perspiration oozes from us in drops one of the servants brings us cold water to drink and then the sweat runs off in streams now our attendants take us in hand they make us lie down on the benches giving us blocks of hot wood for pillows they then begin to squeeze pinch and pound us they twist our heads to loosen the muscles of the neck they pull our arms out and jerk them this way and that they throw them across our chests and pull them back again they exercise the legs bending them at the knees pulling and twisting them they next knead the whole front of our bodies and then roll us over on our stomachs and do the same with our backs continuing until every muscle has been worked over like dough next they lather us with soap scrubbing the skin with gloves of coarse camel's hair and then take fresh tow and scour it clean we are now washed down with warm water and after drying are wrapped in white cloths and taken to a couch in the outer room to sleep we fall at once into a doze and awake to find that the pain is gone from our bodies and that we are wonderfully refreshed some excellent coffee is now brought in we drink it and after dressing depart feeling that a moorish bath is by no means so bad after all leaving the bath we call on the american consul who introduces us to the governor-general of tripoli a stately moor appointed by the sultan of turkey to rule the country he receives us in his palace and talks with us concerning the vast territory under him he shows us that tripoli extends for hundreds of miles along the coast from tunis to egypt and that it goes far south into the libyan desert he tells us that the strip of cultivated land near the sea is not large but that there are many oases supporting all together about a million people the country is not well governed and as in all lands ruled by the turks the citizens are heavily taxed and much oppressed and in civilization and wealth are far behind the neighboring natives who are governed by the great nations of europe tripoli has some of the shortest caravan routes across the desert and ostrich feathers ivory and other products are brought here from central africa to be transshipped to europe we visit the dealers and see them weighing the great white tusks and the beautiful feathers each of us buys a small ostrich plume to send home end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the land of the nile we are now to travel through the strangest of all countries the world has no other land like egypt it is a strip of rich soil which has been built up layer by layer on the dreary sands of the sahara by the mighty nile this river is the longest in africa and with the exception of the mississippi missouri the longest in the world it rises in the highlands near the equator having its source in lake victoria the largest lake in africa it pours out of this lake and races for hundreds of miles through rapids and cataracts then flows more slowly over plains until it reaches the sahara through which it winds its way spreading out into a wide fan where it empties into the mediterranean sea during its course the nile receives some very large tributaries and among others the blue nile and the atbara sometimes called the black nile from the color of its waters the blue nile and the atbara rise in the highlands of abyssinia which are composed of great beds of rich soil when the tropical rains come this soil melts down into the rivers to such an extent 
that it fills not only their waters but even the nile itself with rich mud when the nile is high the waters flow out over the country some of the mud drops to the bottom and this in time has built up the land of egypt the soil varies in depth from twenty to forty feet and it has been estimated that it rises about six inches every hundred years the good land extends just as far out as the water goes and no farther beyond all is sand and barren rock a man can stand with one foot entirely hidden in the richest of crops while the other rests on the barren desert along the greater part of its course the nile runs through a trough in the desert and there the fertile strip is so narrow that we could walk across it in an hour while at other places it is so wide that it would take us about half a day to go from one side to the other until it reaches the latitude of cairo the valley of egypt is nowhere more than nine or ten miles wide although it is almost a thousand miles long below cairo it spreads out like a fan each rib of which is about one hundred miles long ending at the mediterranean this fan is the delta of egypt so named from the fourth letter of the greek alphabet which has a fan-like shape the deposits of the nile are such that the delta grows about eight feet farther out into the mediterranean every year it now extends one hundred miles along the sea coast and grows wider and wider the egypt of the map is about seven times as large as new england but it is mostly desert the inhabited egypt consisting of the delta and the long narrow valley above it is altogether not so large as massachusetts and connecticut combined but it is so fertile that it supports more people in proportion to its cultivated lands than any similar area on the globe much of the country produces crops all the year round and where irrigated two and three harvests are annually gathered from the same soil egypt has no rain but the nile gives it water throughout the year and at flood times furnishes it a meal of this rich mud which causes it to produce without other fertilization when the rains are light in the mountains of central africa there are no great floods then egypt suffers from famine for this reason the people watch the nile carefully they measure its rising from day to day to see if the water will get high enough to spread out over the country there is a column in a well on the island of rhoda in the river of cairo known as the nilometer which marks the flow of the water reports are given out from day to day and when the right height has been reached there is great rejoicing all over the country for the people know they will have good crops and a prosperous year the nile begins to swell about the first of june it increases throughout the summer until october when it reaches its highest level the water is now conducted over all the farms possible and allowed to remain until it has saturated the soil and deposited its mud about the last of october the river falls and the fields become dry in flood times the nile flows fast and in the past great quantities of water and a vast deal of this valuable mud have been carried far out into the sea without being spread over the land now dams have been built to hold back the water and let it out as it is needed some of these dams are among the wonders of the world one at aswan far above cairo is as high as a seven-story house and so thick that three carriages can be driven abreast upon its top it is composed of huge blocks of granite so strongly cemented together that they will hold back a lake one hundred and forty miles long containing more than a billion tons of water the dam is filled when the muddy flood comes down from the mountains and opened again when the nile is low as the water lies in the dam the mud sinks but as the outlets are along the bottom when the water goes out it carries the mud with it and thus distributes it through the canals to farm after farm end of chapter eleven